we'll be able to see about f five to ten feet at best and uh, at worst nothing just feel the line in your hand I wasn't very far in probably only a minute or two minutes and I was seriously considering coming back out because I just thought hopefully it's going to get better but if it doesn't um, it, this is far too dangerous I remember when I first time I heard about cave diving, I thought this is an absolutely crazy thing to do, but you've got to look at it in the context of my own experience and Jeff's own experience. I've been caving for, well, nearly 30 years and uh, diving for nearly 20 years. And you take all these moves forwards to what other, the man in the street would regard as being more and more crazy. It's all done very, very gradually, so I haven't noticed it getting more and more potentially dangerous because we take more and more precautions the further we go. It is early August 1991. Cave divers Jeff Yeadon and Jeff Crossley prepare to make an extraordinary cave dive beneath the Yorkshire Dales Valley of Kingsdale. If they complete it, they will set a new world record. Previous records have been set in large cave passages with clear water, but the conditions on this dive promise to be vastly more demanding. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Lead off. Yeah. Today is just preparation for the big dive tomorrow, but even this will be difficult enough. They are entering Keld Head to take large spare air bottles, which they must deposit a kilometer inside the submerged cave. This is needed to give them enough air to complete their long, difficult and dangerous underwater journey, which will hopefully end here the following day. Kingsdale is one of the most attractive valleys in the Yorkshire Dales, but this beautiful limestone landscape conceals a vast network of underground and underwater passages that lie beneath it. The riverbed, for most of its length, is usually dry, but toward the lower part of the valley, the river emerges below a small cliff face known as Keld Head. For many years, people wondered what might lie further inside. On the hills above, there lies a clue to what lies below. Streams disappear into the limestone rock, sometimes plunging into impressive vertical shafts like Routon Pot and Jingling Hole. Now, 23 years after the original event, we have invited Jeff Yeadon and Jeff Crossley to return to Keld Head to reflect on what they accomplished together. The exploration of the Keld Head system was an, an enormous part of my, of my life um, and it became a, an obsession to anyone on the outside who think, well, what on earth do you want to do that for? But it was a logical progression to me. I'd started as a young caver and got to harder, harder caves, eventually getting into cave diving and going further and further as the equipment developed. And uh, so it was, it was all a logical progression. Historically, early attempts to free dive into Keld Head were to meet with little success. We just thought that this was a rock curtain and, and we hoped that we could uh, drain this pool and of course walk in. This would be about uh, 52. But it must have been 30 or 40 because most of our club members and friends and we, uh, we simply dug away, away down to the sheep gate further down. Oh, we stripped and uh, put uh, shorts on and uh, covered our bodies with motor grease to keep warm. Put tubes around our 
chest to keep us upright in case of accident. Of course, it was pretty hope. Uh, the roof drops as much as 60 feet, so uh, our job was pretty hopeless, but we didn't know that in those days. However, by the late 60s and early 70s, in the caves that lay beneath the western flanks of Kingsdale, progress was being made. In part, it was due to the use of neoprene wetsuits. They enabled cavers to endure the cold cave water. The result was that they could arrive at the bottom of a cave and be ready to explore further. The climax came with the discovery of the Kingsdale Master Cave. It carried all of the water from the caves of West Kingsdale. The stream that was flowing into the sump pool at the end clearly was the same water that emerged at Keld Head, a little way further down valley. Around the same time, with advances in equipment, cave diving was also taking great strides. Mike Wooding made a landmark dive 1,000 feet into Keld Head. Well, by this time we'd settled down in the approach to, to diving. We'd got our equipment reasonably sophisticated and, and secure. We knew we were familiar with it, we, we knew what we could do with it. And we'd gradually inched up in the, the distances we were doing. And it suddenly became apparent that it wasn't air reserves or anything concrete that was limiting the distance of the dives and it, if we took a, a long hard look at it it was obvious that it was purely a mental problem. But that was about the limit of what you could do with a wetsuit. Anything beyond that you got very very cold. In 1975 um, the dry suit came on the open market and uh, Bear, my diving partner and myself both purchased one of these and we've progressively dived further and further into Keld Head. Um, with larger and larger bottles and with a dry suit you stayed totally dry hopefully inside this sealed suit you can control your buoyancy so you could inflate the suit and rise up in the tunnel or deflate the suit and sink down so you, it was in many ways it's like being the captain, captain of a miniature submarine and it made exploration really quite comfortable soon after the discovery of the master cave the opening of a new valley entrance close to the road made exploratory dives possible, not only from Keld Head, but also from the Kingsdale Master Cave. Eventually, in 1978, they were able to join the two lines. A through dive from the Master Cave to emerge at Keld Head was now a possibility. At that time, Jeff and Bear, Oliver Statham, had set up a pottery in Skipton so they could work and dive together. Hello, Jeffrey. Morning, Gibbons. What have you been up to then? The two men are partners. Together they make pots to sell to the tourists who flood the Yorkshire Dales. And together they go cave diving. What are you going to do today, anyway, Jeff? More mugs, I would think. The film, The Underground Eiger. Um, was leapt upon by a sound recordist from uh, YTV, Lindsay Dodd, who I knew, and um, we'd just done the connection dive between Kingsdale Master Cave and Keldhead, found the way through, which was quite a technical task that took um, four years or so. Um, and he, I gave a lecture to um, British Cave Research Association at Manchester Uni, and L Lindsay was in the audience, and he just thought, that's a great idea for the last in the series of once-in-a-lifetime films that was being done by YTV. And that's how it started off. He went to his producer and uh, put the idea to him and they, they bit. At Keld Head, a crowd gathers in the mist to witness the climax. Two and a half hours, one and a quarter miles, the underground Eiger has been conquered. We are nearly there! Go, 
Can, can they drink champagne with a mask on? <laughs> 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 So I've got the cameras. Jeffrey. 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 Oh, great. <laughs> the diving partnership had made an enormous contribution to cave diving, but the following year there was terrible news. Bear, for reasons known only to himself, had committed suicide. Jeff had lost his close friend and diving partner, but the obsession with Keld Head lived on. Other divers and new challenges were coming on the scene. Over the next couple of years, um, I got involved with projects uh, with Jeff and, uh, and a couple of others. And from then on, I got to dive in Keld Head quite regularly. By 1978, just after we'd linked um, Kingsdale Master Cave and Keld Head, um, a new system was found on the opposite side of the valley, King Pot. And that year we dye tested it, uh, put in a green dye, and it came through not into Kingsdale Master Cave, but directly to this spring, which meant that there was an enormous dive possible from the King Pot downstream sump to connect with this system. So it was only much later on come uh, the end of the 80s that we started to look at maybe exploring uh, further towards King Pot. I think it was about 1984 I started to really have a concerted effort to look for the link which involved putting more dye in um, on the King Pot system and trying to actually um, put detectors and see where it came in in the, um, in the through dive. And that didn't work and in the end I just uh, arrived here one day and kitted up and set off on the dive and 200 metres in the whole passage was full of green coming towards me I thought right this is my chance I'll do positive a positive dye trace and follow the dye and see where it comes in and eventually it came in about oh, 400 metres downstream of surfacing in Kingsdale Master Cave so I knew then this is the furthest point upstream where the water from King Pot comes in. But it would not be that easy where the King Pot water emerged was blocked by rock cobbles which needed to be removed before there was any chance of large air bottles going through. Opening it up would take a lot of time and a lot of manpower. There were five divers involved in the project altogether. There was uh, four divers working from, from this end of the system, if you like. There was John Cordingley, Russell Carter, Jeff and myself. And then there was Rupert Skrupka working from King Pot. Um, King Pot, very difficult access to dive because it's actually an underground site with uh, um, considerably diff difficult carry to get to the, to the start of the dive. Once Cobble Inlet was passed, the sheer technical difficulty of the dive was apparent. It dropped to more than 100 feet, 30 meters in depth. As they rose back up from depth, long stops would be required to prevent decompression sickness, known as the bends. Overall, the five divers were to make 29 dives over a period of 10 months. On the 7th of June 1991, Jeff Yeadon and Jeff Crossley reached Rupert Skorupka's line, which marked the limit of his downstream dive. The connection had been made. We'd actually attempted the most difficult link, first in many ways. You know, this was going to be the one that we thought was the least likely to be done. And it's incredible that there was a way open all the way through under this valley and under the valley floor and up the other side when the, the chances in most caves you'll either reach a boulder choke or somewhere where it's too small to get through and it's really a staggering coincidence that the, the route was negotiable all the way through we decided there and then we must do the through dive and to do the through drive meant you not only had to carry a, a, a staggering number of bottles around you but we also had to take a bottle in from here before the day of the dive and deposited it uh, about a kilometre in at Dead Man's Handshake. As day breaks, Kingsdale is peaceful and the weather, thankfully, is fine. It is to be a landmark day in the Dale's history. It is the day of the dive. Cavers are already arriving in Kingsdale. 
A lot of help will be needed to carry the heavy bottles and diving equipment to the diving site in King Pot. Sid Peru and Gavin Crowther are to film underground, whilst a film crew from Yorkshire Television records the events above ground. Yeadon and Crossley must check everything. The dive they face is daunting and there is little room for error. Jeff, uh, 12 years ago, told me, when I was like just a kid, you know, he told me that it was his ambition one day to dive from the newly discovered, which it was in 78, 79, the newly discovered King Pot, right the way through to Kelp Head. And I always remember him saying, well, I don't think it would be done in my diving lifetime. You know? And he's doing it today, you know, so it's, uh, it's really good. I mean, and also to do it with Jeff is quite, uh, it's quite an honor really, because Jeff's been a, you know, he's been an inspiration, I suppose, to um, certainly two, perhaps three generations of cave divers. And the guy's still there at the top doing it. And you can't say more than that. So this top section has been done by um, one diver, Rupert Skrupka, and uh, he's done the first 1,300 feet downstream, all at uh, this 120-foot depth. So that's a bit that... Well, I know the first bit. I've dived the first bit a long time ago, mm. before it went. And uh, so that'll be all new to us. Mm. We've received it, we've received such good support. It's great to do it as, as, as a part of a team. I mean, the whole uh, the whole effort has been a team effort from start to finish. I mean, we're Jeff and I are the lucky two guys who are actually going through. Uh, but we've got like a 15-strong team today backing us up. We've had help from so many other people. I mean, the camaraderie has been fantastic, really. <laughs> the original entrance to King Pot is high on the hill above. But, just like valley entrance, the first explorers realised that a section of the passage in the depths of the cave came close to the surface, and so they dug a new entrance at valley floor level. Without that access, the dive would have been impossible. Transporting the heavy diving and filming gear will, nevertheless, be no easy task. The fact that so many friends have turned out to help is a sure sign of respect for the divers, for what they already have achieved and for what they're now trying to accomplish. This may not be a pleasant task, but they all know only too well that what the two divers face will be a great deal more challenging. The sump where the dive will start is not a welcoming place. It is cold, muddy and fairly restricted. Here, the divers must do final checks to be sure that the precious equipment has not suffered on the way in. Now, in this uncomfortable place, they must change from caving gear into the dry suits they need to protect them from the cold water of the dive. They will then be ready to pull on the back-breaking, complex array of bottles, harnesses, demand valves, meters, and the rest, on which their lives will depend. Very chaotic at the sump pool. We're trying to get our equipment rigged up and attached to us. It's very difficult because of the amount of equipment you've got, which was weighed more than a person. You couldn't really kit up and then walk about and you had to be kitted up in the water. There's always worry of losing something in the gloomy conditions. And I, in the chaos, I forgot to fasten my dry suit zip up fully before I sat down in the water, so I ended up putting quite a bit of water in the suit, which was annoying to say the least. Well, luckily it wasn't too bad, so um, uh, we finished kitting up and 
Jeff quietly slid away in, under the water and, uh, and I followed as, as soon as I could. I just remember as soon as I dipped my head on the water at the head of this deep shaft, it's an 80 foot deep shaft and it doesn't go straight down, it zigzags a bit but the visibility was really bad because of all our 15 or so um, carriers who carried all our equipment it had stirred all the, um, the water up with the feet and so we were now diving in this absolute murk. The visibility was incredibly bad where it was effectively nil this varied between some blackout and some orange glow. So I wasn't very far in, probably only a minute or two minutes, and I was seriously considering coming back out because I just thought, hopefully it's going to get better, but if it doesn't, this is far too dangerous. At 80 feet, the passage levels out, and in fact climbs a little bit, and at that point I began to break out into clearer water, but I got in front of all the stirred up bad visibility. So I thought, oh, I'll hang fire here and wait for Jeff. Twenty-three years later, they are following the route of the dive above ground. The memories remain strong. The flooded cave starts in a most dramatic way. It's a vertical shaft, which I'd um, started the exploration back in 1978. So I, I was given the uh, job of diving first to make sure the line was going in the right place. Uh, it went down about oh, 25 metres and the passage levels out a little bit and, and rises a bit and then it goes over another lip and descends again. And it's at that point, having gone through all this bad visibility, that I turned round and waited for Jeff to turn up. Within 50, 100 feet, I'd almost turned round, but I thought, if, hopefully, just keep going, it might break out of it. And luckily, it broke out into something a little bit. Yeah, I, I remember there. waiting for you for a a good minute or so and then suddenly your lights appeared through the gloom and I thought oh he's made it and at that point we singled okay to each other I turned and then descended feet first down this next deep shaft down to what 35 meters depth and it uh, we then I found clear visibility it went like gin clear and I thought oh it's gonna be a great dive is this and then through a little window and it descended right down into a big hall and I, I offered you to go in front yeah, I I'd had the bad visibility so you gave me the good visibility yeah. So it's just a continual descent down and now in clear visibility for me. It's like, it's like flying, it's like a spaceman drifting away from the space shuttle, that kind of feeling. Not that I've done that. I went ahead thinking, wow, this is fantastic. If it's like this now all the way, but within a very short distance, 30 metres or so, we caught up with the poor visibility caused by the rain of the previous sort of two or three days or uh, to, to when we did the dive. And it, it went back to being effectively like um, diving in best mile beer. All I could see following Jeff was the flippers waft, wafting up and down and the lines sliding through my hand. You could feel the you can feel the extra depth being down at 30 metres. It's sort of you can feel it in your demand valve every breath you take it seems to be just that you can see it counteracting to the extra pressure of water you're at. I knew the tunnel was 10 metres wide and 5 metres high, but you'd only got the memory of that from when we were exploring the tunnel. All we saw was yard after yard of line feeding through your gloved hand, and uh, that went on for oh, an hour and a half. It's this huge passage going over great whale backs of, of silt and gravel and it's like the lunar module really going over the, uh, over the surface of the moon when, um, when they first landed on the moon and it was that kind of feeling.
and then it passes and turns completely to 180 degrees and you're having to go back in the opposite direction to, to where you want to go to but again a known route and sure enough after another 100, 150 metres it then turns back again to head back towards Keld Head and eventually we get to the decompression point. They have crossed deep below the valley and are approaching the low squeezes at Cobble Inlet. As the passage rises, they face their first long decompression stop. So about here we'd been swimming for about an hour and a half all at 30 metres and we started to rise up that rift and get to the decompression stops. Can you remember sort of how long we stopped for and where we stopped? I think the total was about 90 minutes, maybe maybe 100 minutes. It was because um, we did one stop at 9 metres and one at six. And I, the, the one at nine metres was that, that boulder ramp. Yeah, yeah. About, I think that was about maybe half an hour, three yeah. minutes, half an hour. And then the six metre one was about 45 minutes. Yeah. It was uh, cold uh, and miserable, yeah, wasn't it? it was. And by that time, you're really getting stalled with just hanging around in, in uh, cold water, not being able to do anything. You can't speak to each other. Although we had developed a little air bell there, which, an underwater air bell from decompressing there on all the exploration dives. This, um, residual air belt underwater was there so we could surface in it, stick our heads up and just talk briefly but we had to be aware that the um, air belt wasn't too full of carbon dioxide so we kept pumping our demand valves back in. And then the next challenge was the infamous Cobble Inlet which is a, a very low section that we had to dig through when we were exploring it from the other end and with chest mounted cylinders on, there's no way you can get through without taking those off and feeding them in front. Uh, all low, where you had to take your chest mounted bottles off. And we're carrying five bottles at this, this point, all very large um, bottles, two on the side and three across the chest. Um, the chest ones all had to be taken off and pushed in front of us for, for 100 metres through cobble in there first part's like a little keyhole that you have to wriggle yourself into the right shape to get through uh, like a key in the lock and we got we broke through that um, and then into the lower wider part which went on for as I say about 100 metres and you're pushing the bottles in front of you and you're trying to keep your eye on the guideline and it's all a very slow process and um, uh, but that to me was the the most dangerous part because if, if anything had gone wrong there, if say for example the line had broke and we couldn't find the way through, the only option then was to go back to King Pop and that would involve an awful lot of decompression building up again and uh, would have taken us right into our safety air margins. Uh, but it was a calculated risk at the time that, we thought, well, if we do have to go back, we, we should have enough spare air to do it because there comes a tipping point where you just can't carry enough air to allow for every eventuality. You feed one bottle at a time, put it an arm's length in front, then the next one an arm's length in front, and then move forward and then repeat the whole process again and again. And that was for about um, 50 to 100 metres doing that. When that was finished, we were joining the main route from Kingstone Master Cave to Keld Head and a very familiar route for me as I'd laid all the guideline back in 1976 so it was like going on the road home from work when you're driving. It was that familiar. The next thing that you're a bit wary about is the 50 foot shaft that goes back down into the depths of the original Kale head dive. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't intimidating by then because we knew what it was, we knew the depth of it. But it's still from, from a place where you have to take a bit of cake. So you go down feet first and then dump air out. It's like going down in a lift and we reach the ground floor and your feet land on a nice pebble floor. Then you go back into horizontal mode and start finning it. And then we're on the final run for home, um, picking up our spare cylinder, which we dumped the previous day, um, a kilometre in, pick the spare cylinder up, 
split it in um, with all the other clustered bottles on our chest and then uh, headed for home. Several hundred metres on, we reached what was the infamous um, Dead Man Pancake, where I'd had a bit of an epic with the German diver Jochen Hasselmeyer. But that's held no special tears for us now. Just a matter of uh, turning sideways and going through the narrow bit, although I was in the widest part, so no big problem. And We expected that once we'd gone down to 20 metres, um, the, the sump gradually ascends over a long period to the entrance. And we thought we'd probably lose any decompression we needed to do. We'd probably be, be done on during the dive, if you like. But in actual fact, when we got to only 100 metres or so from base, from, well, from the, the, the exit, um, the computer told us we had an hour to do decompression, which was frustrating to say the least because we knew we were so close you could almost touch the, the the end of the dive and yet we had to sit there for an hour underwater um, cold bored if you like waiting to um, for, for the decompression to run out At Keld Head, caving and diving friends await their arrival. If they are anxious, they certainly don't show it. Sid Peru places a bottle of champagne into the cool water in readiness as fellow cave diver Gavin Newman prepares to capture the moment they surface. The air of confidence is infectious, even to Jeff Crossley's parents, who are well used to his exploits. The line starts to twitch, a sure sign. As soon as we were at that last decompression stop, it suddenly dawned on me what a hell of an accomplishment it had been. You don't actually stop to think about that until it stops. You're too engrossed in what you're doing. The green glow ahead is a welcome and familiar sight. It is daylight. Here he is. There is tremendous exhilaration when you surface into that environment where all your friends are lovely day in a totally different world to the one you've just been in totally wonderful experience really and, and one that will live for me for the rest of my life you know probably the greatest achievement i've ever made and uh, and it, it was a, a privilege really to to be able to do it in this country because it means so much more doing it in your own <laughs> Yeah, I'll just get in this one. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, I am actually, Jeff. Yes. Hey, Jeff. Don't want you looking, uh, yeah. looking back at the camera. <laughs> Exhilarated they may be, but they are also exhausted, both physically and mentally, and now must face the cameras and the press. But first, the beer and the champagne. See where the hole is. 
Real's yeah, going down. Else, yeah. <laughs> they have covered a distance underwater of a little over three kilometers, sometimes in restricted passages and mostly in poor visibility, which drops to a depth of 115 feet below the valley floor. It is five past three. They have been underwater for nearly five hours. Their friends are more ready to celebrate than they are. Yeah, it's unpleasant altogether. Uh, uh, certainly once we've got the cobble inlet, it's done. It's done, yeah. <laughs> That's what counts. But uh, as I say, really, it's uh, we're just lucky to going through. It's everybody else who's put us there, isn't it? They've all done it for us. So, like Sir Roop and John and Russell and everybody who's helped us. So, and uh, as I say, doing it with Jeff is quite an honour, really. Wouldn't have been involved in this if uh, they weren't. There wasn't someone like Jeff, who's younger and more enthusiastic, who keeps ringing me up. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> I know where he's been. At least the last, well, last four hours of doing it. Five hours. It's time to retire now, I think. So we've joined two elements, one about 10 kilometres long and then the other one 10 kilometres long. So we've done a much bigger system up, so we've got a 20 kilometre piece now, having done this. And just round the corner is the biggest cave in Britain, um, Lancaster Eastgill, which is 65 kilometres long. And there are a few caves in between, still to link up. So we, when we join them all up, and I don't think I'll be involved in joining them all up, it'll the big cave maybe 150 kilometres long. And that's what's kept me so absorbed and in joining together all these different elements of one gigantic cave that 